Hello, and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest. October 13th, 2022, the Clarence Thomas is a Prince fan edition. I am David Plotz of CityCast. I'm here in Washington, D.C. I'm joined by Emily Bazelon of the New York Times Magazine and Yale University Law School in New Haven. Hello, Emily. Hey, David. And from New York City, John Dickerson of CBS Primetime with John Dickerson. Hello, John. Hello, David. Although, actually, I am <laughs> I'm once again in Washington. Another year, we still, none of us have won a MacArthur, so it goes. But <laughs> our listeners are shocked. However, I am hoping to be I am hoping to be on MacArthur Boulevard at some that point later. Good. This week on the Gab Fest, three LA City Council members are caught on a secret tape saying or condoning racist and just generally repugnant things about their rivals. What does it mean? What should happen to them? What is happening to them? Then the Ukraine war seems to get more dangerous by the week. We will talk once again to Anne Applebaum to make sense of the bridge bombing, Putin's retaliation, Elon Musk's meddling, and more. Then the Supreme Court takes on a fascinating case about fair use, art, Prince, Andy Warhol, The Onion, a lot of other things. Amazing case. Plus, of course, we'll have cocktail chatter. And GabFest listeners, don't forget, on Wednesday, November 2nd, At 7 p.m., we are going to be live in Atlanta at Georgia Tech's First Center for the Arts. Tickets are at slate.com slash GabFest Live. There are premium tickets available. There are swag bags. Uh, We had a great crowd last time we were in Atlanta, and we would love to see so many of you when we're there again. And, of course, it's right before the most important and interesting and crazy Senate race in the country and a wild governor's race. So join us, slate.com slash GabFest Live, November 2nd, Wednesday at the Georgia Tech First Center for the Arts. Hey there, GapFest listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from our partners at Visit Myrtle Beach. From seaside tiki bars to quirky-themed restaurants for kids, Myrtle Beach pairs real tasty food with a real good time. With 60 miles of beach and over 2,000 restaurants, your best self shines when you dine at the beach. Stick around for a story that will get you to mark your calendar for your next trip to Myrtle Beach. Three Latino members of the Los Angeles City Council, all Democrats, have been under huge pressure to resign after a secret tape recording made a year ago was leaked, revealing them saying or just going along with racist, unpleasant, and just plain mean statements about other politicians. The most outspoken of the three, Nuri Martinez, who had been the president of the city council, first resigned as president and on Wednesday resigned as a council member after she was caught using various slurs to describe a two-year-old black child of a fellow council member, uh, saying derogatory things about people from Oaxaca living in Los Angeles and saying of the district attorney, fuck that guy, he's with the blacks. So why... Were you guys surprised that this tape existed and that they were saying things like this? No. No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so let's think if we can figure out all the categories. Um, by the way, uh, whoever was in the hotel room next to me last night decided to have a constant, unending, loud conversation from like midnight till 6 a.m. So if I sound punchy and just totally out of it, this is why. I thought you were going to say, so I understand about people overhearing conversations that they're not supposed to hear. Oh, my God. Anyway, what are the categories? So, David, does it surprise me as an act of human nature? No. Does it surprise me as a political conversation that takes place? No. Does it surprise me in the specific context of Los Angeles and... Um, coalition and racial politics in Los Angeles, which I don't know super well, but which I've read about and thought about. Um, it doesn't surprise me in that context. Um, so I guess in none of the context, those those are three. There might be more. Well, the fact that the tape exists is, I think, surprising because they were having this conversation at the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor. Um, and it seems very strange that there would be a rule of taping meetings that people involved in the meeting wouldn't know about and then would get leaked. Like, that's not good. And that Labor Federation came out with a statement saying they'd had a security breach and they were looking into it. So the things that were said were totally abhorrent. 
I was interested in how much they sounded like old-fashioned Pauls dividing up the spoils, right? So this is a progressive city. You have the idea that people don't speak in these explicitly derogatory racial and ethnic terms. No, in fact, they do. Um, These were Latino politicians who were trying to take more power. Latinos have less power in terms of representation on the council um, compared with the number of Latinos than other racial and ethnic groups in the city. That clearly mattered to these people a lot. I was taken aback at how explicitly racial it was and how cruel it was. I mean, I know people are mean, but like the idea that these people as Latino representatives would see things in such starkly racial and ethnic terms. Yeah, I was surprised by that. I'm just naive. To back up your point about the misrepresentation, Latinos make up roughly half of the city's population, but only hold four of its 15 city council seats. Um, My other fun fact that I read in the Times is that there are 4 million residents and they speak a combined 200 plus languages at home um john, john is doing john is doing a book report on los angeles <laughs> well I, a, col- a city well, i of just i felt like that was color somewhat... and diversity <laughs> uh, no. but i i but but i call the them angelinos there, john, Santa Monica. The and the and the chief export <laughs> the... is the, the euonymus plant um uh no, but I thought those were important figures with respect to the the push and pull and um, uh, and diversity uh, and and the cutting up the spoils. This is a conversation we should note that took place in the context of um, uh, redistricting. But as you said, Emily, the cruelty. The conversation started talking about um, redistricting, but then just got into just like wallowing the, in the cruelty for a little while. So getting back to Marquise, I told Danny, if you want to cut a deal and if you want to, if, if you want to make like the boss moves, I would go after the airport. He goes, I know that idea. I said, tell Marquise, so go take him go, from his friend. Don't go, don't go after, leave him alone. Yeah. Go get the airport from his little brother, mm-hmm. that little bitch bonnet. I, like, well, what? Black I go, I go, what is with the bonnet? What is with bonnet? And I said, bonnet thinks he's Black guy don't think he's black. He thinks he's black. I call the same thing. He goes, yeah. why are they so close? No idea. He's from Massachusetts. This kid, the one here, that's kid. No. He's black. Yeah. 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 Lo trae así during Black History Month. Lo lleva al council. Y lo pone acá en el. Remember, lo trae. He look. It's like it's an accessory when we do the Elmo K parade. Just like when, just like when. They used to have those statues in the plantations. Yeah, it's like when Nori brings her whole yard bag or the 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 Louis Vuitton bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like it's like it's like on the side. Yeah. Lo trae. You see. As you guys know, I'm a big fan of smoke-filled rooms and backroom deals. I was just spent last weekend in the hill country of Texas, and there's so many shrines to LBJ. And you can imagine, you can imagine, and probably these tapes exist of, you know, conversations of this sort that LBJ had that were probably even worse and probably terms that are even more repugnant than ones we heard. Um, and I do think that the best of politics, like politics is great when there's a kind of gimme, gimme, negotiation, scheming, alliances, idealism. And I'm definitely, I'm definitely not even going to try to spend one second defending what they said, because what they said is disgusting. And I don't like, even though we all are slightly different people in private, like they, what they said, or at least certainly what Martinez said was really gross. On the other hand, you do want people to have comfortable spaces to be real and mean and base sometimes and people people can act when they believe they are comfortable when they're around people who they feel comfortable with they can they can express parts of themselves that they don't necessarily express in public and i think that's fine i think politics actually needs that politics is a performative profession and so many effective politicians are great performers and so it is not at all surprising to think that performers are somewhat different behind the scenes and behave somewhat differently behind the scenes. And that's okay to, to be discordant. There to be a discordance between who you are as your public face and who you are in private. And, and that, that part of it is okay. And I also just want to stand up for the idea that people and this, I know John Dickerson stands up for this. People should have spaces where they feel safe to just kind of talk and be themselves. And hopefully they are not so appalling.
Well, okay, but isn't it still, like, what do we make of the fact that in 2022, these progressive politicians, when they're just being themselves, are, one of them is being racist and the other ones are, like, letting her do it and not saying anything. I mean, what one thing it suggests to me is that city politics are, are have often been like this, right? I mean, the city I grew up in Philadelphia, like very much when I was growing up, felt racially and ethnically divided with people representing different factions of the city and vying for power. And so it feels familiar to me and yet also depressing that right now this is where that conversation went. Yeah, I mean, I I guess because I wasn't surprised by it. I mean, I I guess what surprised me was the way in which everybody seemed to be perfectly okay with just being awful. So in other words, the the basic um, uh, commerce of power and race that was throughout the conversation, you know, usually that's kind of understood or implied and everybody understands it in their bones, but they don't say it all out loud. And, but then there's this other category of just being straight up cruel and mean and racist. And that's the thing that surprised me. They spent so much time in that neighborhood. The, but as a political matter, your point about the cities makes me think about Megan Haberman's book and, and Donald Trump, that he grew out of the New York racial politics of the eighties. And that that tattooed a certain view of race um, and fiefdoms on him that that's a part of his continuing DNA. Um, and that is not dissimilar from what we heard in this conversation, which brings me to another point, David, which is how do you square this and your, and your point about private spaces, which I uh, agree with, with Donald Trump's claim that his Access Hollywood tape was just locker room talk? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are, and I was just thinking about this, like, Bill Clinton, who is this a very effective public performer, was also probably, you know, very possibly a rapist. And is it okay to be, oh, I'm a rapist in private, and but I'm a good politician? No, of course not. Like, it's not. And there, there's certain, like, steps beyond which you you can't go. I guess it's, I guess it is that, that there is, I think if they had just been using salty language and that would be different power that's politics not this. yeah it's it's the but what is it but what's the this is it the racist language but i think lots of people talk in racially coded categories when they're in private this wasn't coded no yeah, or but- not even racially co- i meant coded as in like a, a race racial language when they're in private especially when they're talking about something which is explicitly racial which is how do we increase latino political power so not at all surprising that we talk in racial can categories is like the problem the mean stuff they said about the kid or is the problem that they were dividing up the city and saying you know to screw the armenians well neither was so good right i mean the part about dividing up the city you know the attorney general of california rob bonta is now declaring that he's going to investigate which i think is good because there is a point at which this kind of dividing up the political spoils starts to be or should be illegal and so Uh, Yeah, that seemed like a healthy development for Los Angeles. I mean, one thing I was trying to think about is, so I think you can say, okay, when people have these kinds of private conversations and their course and some of it is base, they're kind of revealing some aspect of themselves and the voters can decide, like, we don't want someone who feels that way to some degree in her heart to represent us. And I think there was enough of outrage in Los Angeles that I understand why Nuri Martinez resigned in the face of that. You could also argue that, you know, really what's more important is how effective Martinez is as a representative. What does her record show? And it sounds like she's been a very strong advocate for various causes in the city that she sees as benefiting working class neighborhoods she represents that are largely Latino. And I do, you know, I do wonder about the focus on language and talking and um, this representation of what is in someone's heart versus what kind of action she takes as a city council member. But, you know, in the end, it's like this is the kind of revealing thing that the left in particular does not tolerate right now. And that's what you saw. I want to go back to the Trump thing. I actually, now that I think back, I kind of think that what Trump was saying in private there was okay. The problem with Trump is his public nastiness to me. That Trump is publicly racist, publicly nasty, publicly. I think so, I, you know, hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue, right? 
right? We all know that. And actually... I kind of hate that expression, but you're right. Okay, okay. Actually, it is good to force people to perform being politer than they, than they might be in private. That forcing people, like creating a culture where people are supposed to be polite and decent to each other and smile at each other and not say grotesque things to each other is better than the alternative where people are are you know say the things that are the, the poisonous things that are inside all of us at some point you know people are filled with devilishness and pettiness and viciousness and the the acts that we take to suppress that in public are good but it does you know that it all you have to acknowledge that there are times in private when a lot of that comes out for some people and so for some people it comes out in much more toxic ways as it did with these these folks do you really want to go all the way to defending Trump saying that like reveling and grabbing women I'm by the pussy? Defending. Like I don't think no, you do, I don't defend actually. that. I don't defend that, but I do I do defend the distinction between between private and public spaces and that, that what people do in private and if, especially if you're in a performative profession, the public actions are more important and, and Trump's public actions are despicable, right? And so yes, that just, just disturbs confirmed. me so much more than the fact that he's also saying disgusting, you know, sexually assaultive things in private. Well, I do think there is this larger interesting issue with Trump, which is that he does all this awful stuff in public and then somehow it matters more when it seems like it's in secret. But I also think that if you're going to talk that way about women, it is revealing about something that we already know about this person and it is super not okay. And in the same way, I sort of felt that way about Nuri Martinez. Like if this is the way she sees people in her city um, and a child of her colleagues, like I under, I wouldn't want her representing me either. Well, and it also is the roles there. I mean, this is slicing the, the prosciutto a little thin, but if your role is to be a uh, an advocate for a certain population in a certain geographical area, that's one thing. If your role is to represent an entire country, um, uh, of which women are half the, the percentage, leaving aside all the other ways in which it was disgusting uh, the way Trump was talking, is just there's different connectivity between your private thoughts and your public role in those in those instances, although when you're city council president, you're also overseeing a whole area, not just your your constituency. Um, but I, th- I, I think that David, I don't think he's excusing. It. I think he's trying to figure out where the where the line is um, and recognize that this th- this contradiction, which is true, uh, not contradiction, but this quality that's true that. A lot of these people, uh, a lot of people in politics say awful things behind, maybe not this awful, but um, would not want to be, have their most private comments in public. This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by Brooklyn. And staying informed is a stressful job. I know that my job is about staying informed. And at the end of a stressful day of staying on top of the difficult, tricky, complicated news, you deserve to land on the highest quality bedding because Brooklyn and sources high quality materials and skips the middleman. You can rest easy and luxuriously at a fair price. Not only do I sleep on Brooklyn and sheets, I use Brooklyn and sheets to construct every week my Gabba studio. So I am surrounded right now by pillows clad in Brooklyn and fabric. Their expansions into bath, loungewear, home fragrance, and more have made Brooklyn and a leading expert on the home space and all its rooms. It's election season, so cast your vote at Brooklinen today by checking out their luxurious home and bedding essentials and using promo code GABFEST for $20 off your purchase of $100 or more. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N dot com, promo code GABFEST. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. It can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode when faced with a challenge in life. But when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals no matter how big or small. A few years ago, I was going through a really tough time in my personal life, and I went to a therapist for the first time in my life. And it made a huge difference. It made me focus less on all the kind of storm and chaos around me and more on the control I had and the kinds of things I could do to move myself forward in my life. So if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, affordable, accessible, and entirely online. 
You can get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists anytime. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash GabFest today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash GabFest. We are joined by beloved GabFest guest Anne Applebaum of The Atlantic. She's in Berlin. She's here to talk about the war in Ukraine, which is moving in all directions all at once. Ukrainian forces or some somebody connected with Ukraine seems to have partially destroyed the bridge linking Russia to Crimea, which is a critical Russian supply line, prompting a barrage of Russian attacks at civilian targets across Ukraine. Ukrainian forces continue to gain territory in parts of the country. And then we also have this coming winter energy crunch where, abetted by Saudi Arabia, Russia is going to put huge pressure on Europe, which is going to have extremely high gas prices, shortages of of energy, uh, which could continue for a long time. And also, Elon Musk inserted his intrusive little nose into the war, too, as well. So, Anne, can you start us with this bridge bombing and how important and damaging it was strategically to Russia. So first of all, it's important to understand that this wasn't just an ordinary bridge, you know, for pedestrians to stroll across. Um, it was built after the annexation of Crimea, and it has a really important strategic significance for the war. It's both a car bridge and also a train bridge. And it was on that bridge that the Russians have been bringing supplies to the occupied parts of southern Ukraine, which are very hard for them to Um, logistically difficult for them to supply otherwise. So this was not an act of terrorism. It was an attack. It was a, it was a legitimate war target. And it's one that people have been speculating about since the very beginning of the war. So the role of the bridge as a significant part of why the Russians are able to conduct this war has been known for a long time. Um, And it was for that reason that everybody assumed the bridge was very, very well guarded, um, you know, with drones and, I don't know, underwater drones as well, and um, soldiers and sailors and so on. And so the sight of it burning, um, you know, a few mornings back was a, a kind of jolt. You know, it meant that the Ukrainians, you know, did have a, we don't still don't know actually, by the way, what exactly caused the caused the fire and caused part of the bridge to collapse. But it was either a very good special services operation um, or it was some kind of missile we haven't seen yet, or it was, you know, guys who snorkeling. I mean, we actually, you know, we don't know, but but it was it was it was very well done. I did hear. I have to tell you one theory, and it came from a Russian, a member of the Russian sort of democratic opposition, if you can call it that, in exile, um, who says, you know, of course it wasn't the Ukrainians; it was the FSB, the Russians blowing up the bridge in order to make a point. But you know, so I, I give you, I concede that there are there's enough unknown that it could be. Maybe lots of other people, but um, we, you know, we have to cui bono who who benefits. You have to assume it was the Ukrainians, um, and clearly the sight of it burning was very shocking to Russians, um, both because Putin has made a great song and dance about Crimea being eternally Russia and it will always be part of Russia, and this meant this casts some doubt on that idea, um, and also because it, as I said, it, it implies that the Ukrainians have some kind of you know, unbelievably good secret way of operating that we nobody knew about. Um, and so the, the the political significance, the kind of information war, if you will, significance of it was, as, in addition to the strategic significance, was very high. You know, it showed they can do things. It showed they aren't giving up. They aren't quitting the war. Um, and it also shows that, it, you know, Crimea is one of their war aims. So then obviously we have these retaliatory strikes in in 10 um, Ukrainian cities, um, killing, I think, 20 civilians and in, injuring something like 100 more people, which seemed like clearly Putin trying to strike back, but also kind of like an act of desperation to return to this kind of terrorizing the civilian population, which was an earlier tactic last February and into March and April. I mean, there have been moments of it, but it just seemed like a return to that kind of city bombing. And then we have, you know, the kind of Western alliance saying we are with Ukraine in the long haul. We're going to send more weapons. We're we're not going anywhere. Do you think that we're maybe in the kind of home stretch where Russia is striking out um, in that kind of caged bear scary way that I think you anticipated? But um 
that this signals that Russia really can't turn things around? So first of all, there's some question about whether this really was retaliatory, whether it had been planned in advance. Um, it isn't that unlike some other things that have happened during the, you know, in the last few months. But essentially, you're right. It's, you know, if he were winning the war, if he were winning the war militarily, Putin wouldn't be attacking Ukrainian civilian infrastructure because he wouldn't need to. And so, yes, it is a kind of act of desperation. It's part of um, the turning point in the war that really began three or four weeks ago when the Ukrainians made that offensive across the north and it became clear that they could take back territory. And then since then, we've had this mobilization, um, the you know, draft of Russians, uh, as well as the, you know, now these these civilian attacks. So it's, they, I agree, they are a sign of weakness. They're not a sign of strength. They're a sign of, you know, you know kind of shift, attempt to shift tactics. I don't think we can say yet that they're the end game, but they are evidence that the military operation is going badly. And some U.S. military officials are saying, it can't be reversed. The the draw, you know, the conscription isn't working out. And even if you can get all of these um, uh, motley soldiers to the front, they don't have the command and control to operate effectively once they got there. So, so I don't know. That's just a kind of comment, which leads me, to, I guess, to the tactical use of nuclear weapons. What's your take on that, and also its use as a as a propaganda piece? We kind of, we know about the Putin end, but Biden either on purpose or as a kind of Biden-esque gaffe, said we're in as perilous a state as, as America has been since uh, 1962 in the Cuban Missile Crisis. On the one hand, that could be his hyperbole. On the other hand, it could be uh, something that focuses on this nuclear question and puts Putin in a different position. How did you sort through all of that? So first of all, sort of though most Americans are unaware of it, Putin has been talking about nuclear weapons for a long time and periodically threatening to use them, going back a decade or more. When they do military exercises um, for the last several years, they have exercised the use of nuclear weapons and they do that deliberately as a kind of scare tactic. So this has been, this is actually not as new as you think it is. You know, the thing about nuclear weapons is that the, you know, historically, the way they were, we prevented the Soviet Union, for example, from using them in the past, and the way in general it's that there's a whole doctrine evolved around this, that you prevent their use by deterring it. So in other words, it's true that, um, you, know, I don't, you know, I don't read Biden's mind, but I, um, it, he could well have been talking about it as a way of messaging to the Russians, this is very serious and we are planning a very serious response. And there have been some other leaks to that effect. Um, we will respond by taking out the Black Sea Fleet or there will be a, some cyber attack. I and mean, there have been sort of different versions of what we would do in response. And that's happening, um, A, because I think people are discussing it, and B, because um, we want to convince the Russians that this would be a very, very bad idea. Um, I mean, there is a, you know, whether or not they would really do it is a long and complicated conversation you know, during which you would have to sit down and think what would be achieved by doing it? How are they thinking about it? Because just lashing out, you know, exploding a bomb because you're really, really mad ha doesn't win you anything. So the Ukrainians, by the way, are psychologically prepared for this to happen already. They assume there could be something like this or some other horrible, um, tragic event. Um, and so, you know, what would the Russians achieve by doing it? Well, they would, you know, they you could use it on the battlefield, but then, the, you know, the radiation would blow back into Russia. Um, you could take out a Ukrainian city and then you would have mass casualties and there would be a, um, you know, an international backlash. Russia's kind of half friends in China and India and South Africa um, might think twice about this. The Chinese are clearly not interested in the in the taboo on nuclear weapons being raised because they're. Quite a lot of people have them in Asia, you know, Pakistan, India, um, you know, North Korea. Uh, so there are a lot of people who don't want them to do it. And there are a lot of reasons to expect that there would be a lot of backlash from from doing it. So so what would they you know, you have to sort of think about what it's very hard to see what they achieve. Like, what do they you know, when you think about it rationally, what what would be the point of it? And I had a conversation last week with an energy expert that was very sobering to me and it was right after the Saudis and OPEC had, had declined to or had, had decided to cut production. Uh, and just the sense that that you in Europe are about to go through a hard winter and that there simply isn't enough 
energy available, easily available to feed Europe. Maybe you get through this winter, but it's just going to drag down all whatever whatever reserves there are. So next winter would be a catastrophe. D- does it feel like this is having the demoralizing effect that Putin hopes it will have? So I can't speak for every European country. Um, and there are different politics and different... I thought you men- could. I thought that was... I thought that <laughs> <laughs> She's ambassador to Europe for the gap I, Yes, yes. No, Portuguese politics, I can't really, you know. But, but, um, but I, you know, I can talk about Germany, which um, partly because I'm here and I and this is this and Ukraine are the two things I've heard people talking about for the last three days. And the Germans seem pretty confident that they are going to be okay. I mean, they will pay a price um, in higher energy prices, but they seem to think they have enough resources to get through this winter. I'm even more worried about other places which aren't as rich and didn't plan as well. Um, I was in Moldova this summer, um, which is almost totally dependent on Russian gas, uh, which is very poor, um, and where the government is a pro-European um, part of sort of pro-European, pro-Western, pro-democratic political movement, and their opponents are pro-Russian. And so there will be a political dynamic immediately where the pro-Russian party says, if you elect us, we'll get cheap gas again. Um, and so um, there, there, are, there are a number of places where there will be a political dynamic around gas and the high price of energy, which, which, which could um, certainly damage enthusiasm. I mean, I do think, I, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm going to be proven wrong, but I do think that at least in Germany and in most other places, the the sense that this is a new and different moment and that some things have changed forever um, and that the old model of you know, old energy models are have run out. I think it's penetrated at least some parts of the political class. You know, people seem to get that there's that there were and there's a sort of different conversation happening now in terms of the war. It's also important to understand that the, you know, the leader of the coalition to help Ukraine is the United States. Um, And the United States is actually not, I mean, we also have higher energy prices because of the global markets, but we are not as dependent on Russian gas as Europe is. And so um, as long as the main question is, will the United States stay, you know, an ally of Ukraine? And that um, seems to me undoubtedly going to be the case, at least as long as Joe Biden is in the White House. And the last time we talked about this, um, I took great heart in your saying that if the coalition does hold together, that that could really be like a, you know, paradigm shifting huge moment for um, pro-democracy forces for the world, really. And I just want to yeah. hear you tell me that. Still again. true. Good. <laughs> okay. You, you, okay. <laughs> you want to hear that bedtime story one more time? Yes, please. <laughs> That's right. No, I mean, um, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm actually kind of a natural pessimist rather than a natural optimist. So I, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking about something that could be rather than something I'm absolutely certain of. But yes, I do think that um, a victory for Ukraine, by which I mean, um, Ukraine at least regains the territory it lost since February. And, and Russia perceives the war to have been a mistake. Um, that if that happens, um, and if Russia is per- also perceived to have been defeated, then we will be living in a slightly different world where the prestige of, um, you know, aggressive, um, not just anti-Western, but, you know, autocratic, uh, anti-liberal, anti-openness, um, you know, strongmen, dictators will be will have their prestige diminished. I mean, I think that's already happened, actually, just to some degree. And what do you make of Elon Musk's um, role as both hero and goat? Hero from Starlink, goat from... um, I talked to John Herbst, the former Ukrainian ambassador, who said basically Musk's effort at putting together a deal was a signal to Putin that the West is getting tired of this fight and is looking for exit ramps and that um, Musk should be quiet. Um, What's your view? I mean, I've seen so many businessmen look at politics and say, oh, I could do that. You know, that looks really easy. I mean, I interpreted that as kind of Musk's egotism rather than any sign of what the West can can or would do. I mean, there were a number of odd things about his original tweet or his original comment. 
Um, one of them was that whether or not he actually spoke to Putin, and by the way, I now have heard from other people who say they've heard him say he spoke to Putin. So whether he's either lying in denying it or he's lying in saying he did it, I don't know which. Um, but there was one odd thing about it, um, which was that he used kind of Soviet style language, even in the tweet. He referred to Crimea being part of Ukraine as Khrushchev's mistake. I mean, nobody talks like that except Putin and Putinists and people around Putin. So someone from there got to him. It's a little bit like sometimes Tucker Carlson says things that don't come from his reading of the U.S. press. Um, somebody, you can tell that he, he made a comment about a, a, a pro-Russian oligarch in Ukraine called Medvedchuk, whom he described as Zelensky's opposition. But, you know, Medvedchuk is not a household name in America. I don't believe he's a household name at Fox News. Um, some somebody clearly told Tucker that this is, you know, this is, you know, t to say this and this and to use this kind of language. So you have that in, in both cases. You can you can almost see when someone's been talking to um, a Russian source or informer or lobbyist, you can hear the effect of it in the way they speak. And so so, yes, what you know, what Musk was was transmitting was Putin's Putin's idea now is probably that what he would like to do is keep these territories he falsely claims to have annexed um, to freeze the war for a while while he remobilizes and rearms. And while also, by the way, it's about to be winter and it's going to be raining and snowing in Ukraine. Um, and he would like to freeze the war and rearm and regroup and try again next spring or next year or something like that. I, I imagine that would be very useful for him. And so anybody willing to repeat that idea in the Western media is fine with him, whether it's Elon Musk or Tucker Carlson doesn't really matter. In the case of Elon Musk, I'm sort of surprised he fell for it. But then, as I say, on the other hand, business people who suddenly encounter the world of high politics are often taken in by it. And Applebaum of The Atlantic, thanks for coming on the GabFest always. Thank you. Slate Plus members, you get bonus segments on the GabFest and other Slate podcasts. And the bonus segment today is a very special one. We talked to John and John from They Might Be Giants about our new theme and how they composed it and how they work. And it was an incredibly fun conversation with two brilliant musicians about, about what it's like to, to make music and, and to come up with music. And it was so much fun. Uh, if you become a member today, you can hear that conversation. Go to slate.com slash GabFest Plus to become a member today. We should note that the conversation had, I would say, at least 75% more Robert Goulet than our normal conversations. That's a fair statement. On season three of What Could Go Right, Progress Network founder Zachary Carabell and executive director Emma Varvalukas have revamped the show's format. The big questions, the expert guests, and the forward-looking perspective remain the same. But now the show's hosts are discussing the immediate news of the day the stories that affect listeners right here and right now. Guests this season include California Rep. Eric Swalwell, a Democrat, and former Kansas Governor Jeff Collier, a Republican, on the prospect of bipartisanship for America. Other guests include Bob Hertzberg of the California State Senate. From elections to climate change to technological advances, Zachary, Emma, and their guests bring their perspectives to 2022's most crucial issues. What Could Go Right is available wherever you find your podcasts. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Visit Myrtle Beach. In Myrtle Beach, the choices are endless when it comes to eating out. There's fine dining, there's bar food, there's pizza places all up and down the Grand Strand. That's Caleb Weigel. He's the author of the Myrtle Beach Mystery Series, and there's one meal at a farm-to-table restaurant he still thinks about. Its menu changes seasonally with whatever's fresh. It's called Heirloom Bistro. I never experienced, you know, a fine dining establishment like that before, where the ambiance is cozy and elegant and you feel comfortable just, just walking in the door. The lighting's low, there's candles everywhere. The back wall is filled with bottles of wine. And, and the wait staff, as soon as you walk in the door, there's one or two people there to greet you. Their amazing chef just creates dishes based off what they're able to get from local farmers. I had a 12 ounce ribeye that was topped with like a gorgonzola topping. My wife had this chicken dish. It was like marinating all these herbs and spices and it just melted in your mouth. This was some of the best chicken we'd ever had. 
when it comes to your food options in Myrtle Beach, no matter what I'm craving, I can find it. And usually I can find it at a very high level. In Myrtle Beach, you have permission to be who you are and eat what you like. Mark your calendar for unforgettable dining and a trip to the beach. Plan your next getaway to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina at visitmyrtlebeach.com. Emily, situate us in this fascinating Supreme Court case argued yesterday, pitting Andy Warhol's estate slash foundation against a photographer, uh, Lynn Goldsmith, who took a picture of Prince that Warhol turned into a series of prints back in 1981 at the behest, under the payment of Condé Nast. Um, We learned, first of all, that Clarence Thomas was a Prince fan. But tell us about the issues in this case and why the Supreme Court is taking it. Breath of fresh air this case because it doesn't feel like it's necessarily going to divide along the usual dispiriting ideological lines. So this is a case about fair use of one person's artwork in making another person's artwork. There's this beautiful photographic portrait of Prince that Lynn Goldsmith made. And then in 1984, around the time that Prince released Purple Rain, Vanity Fair hired Andy Warhol to create one of his trademark, you know, vivid color portraits of Prince. They paid Goldsmith $400 to license her photo as a reference for um, for the artist, for Andy Warhol, and they agreed to credit her and just to use her photo in connection with a single Vanity Fair issue. So then Andy Warhol makes um, the the picture for Vanity Fair, but a series of 16 images that become very valuable prints. Um, and after Warhol's death, the Andy Warhol Foundation uh, starts selling these prints. There's another ripple where Vanity Fair publishes a special issue celebrating Prince's life in 2016, and then it goes back to the Andy Warhol Foundation and pays them about $10,000 to use one of the, a different issue from the series. But really, I think what's at issue here is that this um, 16 print run from Andy Warhol is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And Lynn Goldsmith feels like she deserves some part of that, that there should be a way in which her copyright for her photograph applies to these incredibly valuable artworks. And so the test here from the Supreme Court's point of view, um, the test for fair use of one artwork and making another one is whether Warhol's work transformed Goldsmith's photographs. And the way that the court talks about this is, Does the new work add something new with a further purpose or different character, altering the first artwork with new expression, meaning, or message? And that's a hard question for judges to grapple with, right? It's like a question of art criticism. It's a pretty deep question. And there's really strong feelings here on both sides about what it would mean to extend Goldsmith's copyrights to Warhol's prints, which are iconic, absolutely, in their own right. And I thought this fascinating discussion um, among the lower court judges, when you look at the photograph of Prince, the main emotion it conveys is his vulnerability. There's something very um, full of expression and... um, And yeah, vulnerability and soulfulness in his expression. And that's not the emotion that the judges uh, on the lower courts thought that Warhol's prints conveyed. And so that was their definition of transformative. And that's just a funny role for judges to be in. Isn't the central question here is not only is the original artist getting due credit for their work, and that's important because art art is obviously inspired by inspiration, but but it's also um, credit where credit is due is a principle. But on the other hand, the benefit of fair use is there is this wonderful ferment and extra creative expression that comes from being able to build on work that exists already. So they are both coming at it just from a purely artistic, not remunerative standpoint as being the seed of artistic expression will not flower in a world where either original artists get their credit or um, derivative artists are not allowed to ever um, mess with an original work. Um, and so does that do we think that's the right way to frame it? Yeah, I mean, always with copyright, you have this question about, on the one hand, all art is derivative, right? You're always building on works that come before. You don't want to cut off anything in that potential wellspring of creativity and inspiration. And yet with copyright law, we have this idea, well, we don't want people basically stealing from each other. We want the original artist to be able to 
properly be compensated for their work so that those original artists will keep making art, right? I tend to lose sight of that a lot of the time as the consumer because you just think like, okay, great, we'll let them sample from this other song because I love this new song and who really cares about the old song? But to give it its due, the idea of having some limits to fair use is that it's really important for artists basically to be able to make a living. And when you look at the incredibly uneven compensation here between Goldsmith and Warhol, you can see where she feels frustrated. Well, okay. I have a f- several points to say. One is I bet Lynn Goldsmith's photo is worth a hell of a lot more than it would have been had Andy Warhol never done his print. So the idea that she has lost economic value from this print because Andy Warhol has made made it so much more a thing i think is wrong no one would have seen that print again otherwise or very few people and it certainly wouldn't be worth any i'm sure she she still licenses it i'm sure it's still valuable i also i had a question which is if you were the photographer in this case is there anything to stop you from writing into your original license to vandy fair that you want a perpetual piece of whatever derivative value is in in art that's created off of this. She I mean, the only thing to stop you would be whether Vanity Fair would have signed right. the contract, and but that's Fair, a good right. question. Right, and, <laughs> I think you Fair, can. And, and if your art is good enough, if your photograph is good enough that people are like that, this is it. This is the photograph that makes it. That people will sign that contract and they'll give you because they... But basically, Warhol could have made this with any number of different photographs. Any There's a million photographs of prints that could have been the derivation of this. And the the value is created by Warhol's transformation. I don't think you can, you know, I don't think you can claim, you know, I don't think Goldsmith can possibly claim that the value was created by her photograph in a meaningful way. It was the, the value is, is this transformative act that Warhol does. And therefore the Warhol Foundation or Warhol should be the primary beneficiaries. I will. And then one final point I want to make, which is It is clear that whatever decision the Supreme Court comes to, it will protect the right of Disney to stop you from using Disney's Winnie the Pooh. Perpetually copyright Mickey Mouse. Yeah, or stop you from using Darth Vader how you want to. So whatever – I suspect they will come down on the side of Warhol in this case in the art, but it will not extend to the point where you can, you know, make your own uh, Luke Skywalker – series of, you know, you paint Luke Skywalker blue and you have blue, Luke Skywalker, uh, that's not going to be allowed. Because the Supreme Court is so corporate and because we have these... Conti- the yeah, we know, we know, we know that protection. Disney will protect, get that protection. The um, uh, question I have, Emily, is on the four-fact test for um, fair use. One thing that I thought um, Goldsmith did seem to have a leg to stand on was not David's very good point, which is that the original photograph gains in value based on Warhol or whether she gets a piece of Warhol's, um, you know, the extraordinary value of the prints he created. But one of the tests was that whether the, the, the new art had an effect on the use of the market for the original work. And it does seem like you could make a claim that of all the, let's say, um, you know, in 10 years, there's a, a spate of prints um, retrospectives um, that they would use the Warhol print instead of the original photograph just to illustrate whatever magazine piece or otherwise, and that that does knock her out of a specific thing um, that she would have. That, that's direct competition as opposed to wanting a piece of what Warhol created in his art. Yeah, I think that is an interesting point, right? I have to say, though, I am like super pro having very liberal fair use policies. Like it's hard for me to just abandon that stance for a second. I feel so strongly (laughs) about it. However, it does seem like Lynn Goldsmith got kind of screwed here, right? I mean, to me, it's not, I don't care that much that he could have used a different photograph. He used her photograph. And the value of the two things is so uneven that you just feel like, oh, come on. She could have gotten something more, but it does go back to that original contract. I think you know, this is a little technical, but she signed this contract with Vanity Fair and then Warhol went and made these other prints and wasn't bound by that contract. And so there is something like questionable there about how the contract got played out. And I I do wonder, and again, maybe this is kind of like lawyerly and annoying of me, but if you are a person who 
sells your work, like uh, even just freelance normal journalism, they often ask you to sign away your rights in perpetuity so that they can use things forever however they want. It drives me crazy. It's so unfair. And I think mostly companies get away with this because artists just sign away. They just figure, or I shouldn't call journalists artists, but, you know, creators are just like, okay, whatever. I'm just glad to get paid at all. Happy to be, right. Yeah. But if you, I have done this, if you question, if you say like, wait a second, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm crossing this paragraph out. You usually can win those disputes. And so I do encourage creators of content to read their contracts carefully and to try to push back because I think those incredibly pro, uh, you know, buyer contracts are just there because the, it's the, um, you know, it's the magazine or the company that creates the contract, not because they actually, uh, will necessarily insist on all those terms. Well, you but and you pointed out something that's so true, Emily, and yet so hard when you're just like, as you said, so happy to be having your thing published. And if you get an agent or a lawyer to fight these battles for you, because they see those paragraphs coming a mile away, and they're like, no, they're asking too much. That's great. But then you end up paying your agent and lawyer more than the then you got paid for the piece. So, <laughs> well, right. But I mean, I have to say, I and like you can learn how to spot those things yourself, and you can just cross them out. That's what I myself do. I mean, I know I went to law school, but believe me, I'm no lawyer. And there is, if you just read the fine print, essentially, you can see like, oh, wait a second, do I really need to license this for every single thing they could ever do with it without getting paid again? No, I don't. Let us go to cocktail chatter. When you have sold your warhol, you're sitting on a pile of gold, drinking a cocktail made of Patron gold. What are you going to be chattering about, Emily? I am reading two books that I really recommend to listeners. Um, One is called The Fight for Privacy. It's by Danielle Citron, who is an incredibly smart, thoughtful law professor. She's writing about particularly what she calls the right to um, intimate privacy. She's been thinking for a long time about, you know, what happens to people when their images, particularly sexual images, are appear online? How do they ever control their reputations again? And the problem, of course, with broadly protecting a right to privacy is it can start to infringe on the right of speech um, because you want people to be able to disseminate information freely. How do you really draw a line? And I think Danielle is just thinking in such a sensitive and smart way about this. I'm really learning from reading her book. Uh, So I recommend it, The Fight for Privacy. And I'm also reading a book um, by my friend Nikki David off called The Other Side of Prospect, which is a sort of tapestry. um, It's about a murder and a wrongful conviction in New Haven, but it's really in a lot of ways just this incredibly rich history of New Haven um, with this detailed information about what, you know, people in particular neighborhoods were eating 50 years ago. I mean, it's just beautiful and um, full of riches in that way. And then there's this story of, you know, these families, both the murder victim's family and the person who was wrongfully accused that are very moving. And Nikki stuck with this reporting for years. Um, it's, It's in some ways like an old fashioned book in the best way. So The Other Side of Prospect by Nicholas Davidoff. JD, what's your chatter? My chatter um, is for all the Cormac McCarthy fans out there. I am um, a Cormac McCarthy fan, though not a completist. For those who seek complete understanding, uh, Cormac McCarthy is is often labeled reclusive. He does not do um, interviews. I think the last one he may have done was the New York Times Magazine in 1992. Um, anyway, he does not talk much, but it turns out he talked more than a little, from 1968 to 1980. And all of these interviews are collected. They're, um, they're in uh, Tennessee and um, Kentucky newspapers um, about the early period of his career and writing. And um, if you are a fan, they've all been collected by the Cormac McCarthy Journal in the October issue. Uh, and you can find it online. We'll put a link in the show notes. Um, but as somebody who is um, always interested in process, um, and uh, and then it, they are uh, rewarding in that sense. And then also, if you are interested in this author who doesn't speak much to the press, there you go. My chatter is about an experience I had this weekend. I So I had a weekend in Texas with my brother and my youngest son. 
and we went to the hill country west of Austin, mostly to Wimberley and Fredericksburg and Blanco and San Marcos, these wonderful towns, incredible barbecue, Friday night football. Um, it was great, great trip. But I want to comment on something that this part of Texas has done that every place should do, which is that so many of the food or bar establishments, bars are these it's sort of an outdoor bar or an outdoor food truck gathering or a restaurant that has a lot of outdoors. You order usually inside and then you go sit outside at these scattered picnic tables. Maybe there's a cornhole set there. Maybe someone's playing country music on a stage. You, there are fairy lights strung in trees above you, the oaks above you. And you just have this outdoor experience of your meal, but it's not outdoor in the way you have in a crowded city where you're like cheek by jowl with someone else's because there's a space limitation. It's just like you're sort of, it's like a picnic. It's like a picnic, but you've paid to be at a picnic. You've paid to have a bar experience at a picnic. And you can do this in Texas, as my girlfriend pointed out to me, because land is cheap and you, you can't do this in downtown Washington or downtown New York. But the idea of the the eating experience or the drinking experience as basically a large picnic surrounded by music and other people in this in this fragrant and, and lovely outdoor space is incredible. It's glorious. And any place that has spare land should do it because it is it's the best way to to have a to have a meal or to have a drink. I love that observation. I went to this wonderful pop-up pizza outside um, in Worcester, Vermont over the summer that was similar. It was in someone's backyard full of trees and a garden, and everyone was kind of sitting around. There was a fire. Yeah, lovely. Uh, listeners, you have great chatters. And this one um, came to us. It came to us uh, on email at gabfest at slate.com, but you can also tweet them to us at, at slate gabfest. And it's an amazing chatter from Laura Lowenstein. This is Laura from Cleveland, Ohio. My chatter is about two golden retrievers named Samson and Baylor that live in Stowe, Vermont. Until recently, they were hiking the local Pinnacle Trail, a 3.7 mile out and back trail every day unaccompanied for over a decade. Their owners fitted them with bear bells so that they would not get targeted by hunters and dogs would just go up and down the trail, hang out with hikers, get snacks and take naps at the top of the trail overlooking the view. There's a great 15-minute documentary about them called The Mountain Dogs. Unfortunately, early in the pandemic, Baylor passed away at age 12. But since then, Samson has been hiking the trail by himself. I watched this movie, The Mountain Dogs. I wept. I wept watching it. It is, oh my God, it's an amazing story. I'm like tearing up just thinking about it. I'm saving it for the weekend, it seems. I can't so watch Dog. I can't, I, come on, what are you doing to me? <laughs> The, Lassie the, the, was the, enough the, for you. The dead dog, no, the it, dog dying, does not happen in the movie. So the, the, both dogs. Well, are alive I know, but just all, all dog happiness. I just can't. I can't do it. And on the other hand, somehow has transferred her grief about George into a basically uninterrupted TikTok slash Instagram story obsession with dog videos. She's unstoppable. That is our show for today. The GabFest is produced by Shana Roth. Our researcher is Bridget Dunlap. Our theme music is by They Might Be Giants, who you're about to hear from in the Slate Plus segment, all you lucky Slate Plus members. Ben Richmond, Senior Director for Podcast Operations, Alicia Montgomery, VP of Audio. Follow us on Twitter at, at @slategabfest and tweet your chatter to us there. And go to slate.com slash GabFest live to get tickets for our Atlanta show on Wednesday, November 2nd. Please come to it. It's going to be great. For Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson and David Plotz, we will talk to you next week. Hello, Slate Plus. How are you? As many of you may have noticed, we have a new theme on the GabFest recently, and that theme has a story behind it. We have long been fans of the band They Might Be Giants and the the duo of Johns who make up They Might Be Giants, John Linnell and John Flansburg, um, or who are the who've made it up for mo its entire existence. Um, and some months ago, about a year ago, we mentioned to John Flansburg, I emailed John Flansburg, who I have a, a small relationship with, that, that we were thinking of changing our our theme for the for the Gabfest because. Anyway, there's a backstory there. And John Flansburg immediately said, we want to do it. We're going to do it. They might be giants. We'll do this. And so what followed was 
some wonderful back and forth over a couple of months uh, where the Johns were writing a new theme for us. We got to hear their amazing ideas, rejected ideas. We rejected some ideas. And then one day we woke up and we had a new theme. And we are so happy to be joined by John Linnell. John Flansberg is having some technical difficulties. So we have just John Linnell with us. John, welcome to the GabFest again. Welcome back. Thank you, David. I'm going to ask, start with a really basic dumb question, because I am not a musician and I don't really have the language to talk about music, but you do. So can you briefly explain what this theme does and how it does it? I know that's a vague, big question. The sort of the initial impulse for us, of course, was to write a song uh, because that's kind of our home base. So uh, we we made a bunch of demos that were sort of funny songs about you guys. Um, I think that, you know, it was between your producers and uh, and our sort of thoughts about it that we realized like, Oh, David always talks over the intro, so it's maybe maybe it doesn't make sense to have it be a, a lyric. Uh, that would be you know crosstalk. Um, and what we really should do is come up with a with a nice instrumental. Um, and then the process from that point was that I did this kind of rough demo um, using that was just a snippet from our Slate Plus conversation. If you want to hear the whole conversation. Go to slate.com slash GabFestPlus to become a member today.